Welcome to Southcrest, y'all. My name is Matt. Glad you're here. If you're a first-time visitor, man, thanks for thanks for showing up. Uh, we are in the middle of our sermon series called "Gather and Go," where we are looking at the vision and um, of our church, what we're gonna ra- what we're gonna rally around as believers, and what we're gonna give our energy and effort to. And uh, in your seats, we have um, some cards for you, some fill-in-the-blank cards. Would love for you to grab one. I know we have some ushers with a few more, so if you need one, they can probably walk around. Joey's coming around, so if you need one, just throw your hand up. Joey's gonna hook you up. All right, so follow along with us if you can, and. Um, As a little pop quiz, we're going to do a a quick recap here. For those of you who were here last week, if I was to say Geico, you would say, that's right, Geico Insurance. I had a friend of mine who came up to me before service who works for State Farm. He said, let me fix this for you. Scribble that out and put State Farm. But uh, anyway, a vision statement, just getting into this thing, a vision statement is our direction. Right, it's our rally cry. It, it it's it's a statement that we can put our efforts together around, and so to speak, we can all row the boat at the same time and see some momentum and see some movement for the kingdom of God. So our vision statement, <clears throat> excuse me, is our direction. That's where it's where we're going. And and if you remember last week, we actually started there, but then we even backed up further and we talked about why it is that we even exist. Why did God create us? And we said that I was made or we are made, I'm, I, I'm made to glorify God and to live in such a way that brings honor to him. That's the whole purpose of our existence and why we're alive. And when we align ourselves to that purpose, guess what? There's fulfillment there. There's joy. There, there's, you know, we find purpose in that. Because that is our purpose. And so we're called to glorify him. We're called to worship him, enjoy what we just got done doing, enjoying him. And then we're going to live in such a way that brings honor to him. We looked at multiple verses last week that, uh, that proves that and that backs that up. And there's another one here. As well, I put down John 15. Oh, man, we might even get into John 15 next week some. It's so powerful. It's, it's, it's us. It's all about abiding in Jesus. And this is what he says as it relates to this statement here. John 15, verse 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciples. So when we stay connected to the vine, when we stay connected to him, we're going to bear fruit. That's gonna, our lives are going to look different. The fruit of the Spirit's going to pour out of us, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and the things that we do. And all of that glorifies God and it proves that we're his disciples. And we, when we live in such a way that brings honor to him. And then we talked about last week uh, what's called kind of the meta narrative, right? What's the overarching story of God's word? It's broken up into four parts or four chapters. You remember those, right? We have creation, we have the fall, we have redemption, and we have restoration. Okay, and we're going to talk about this a lot because this is important over the next years and weeks and months and all. Uh, uh, Creation, God created the heavens and the earth, the stars, humans, all of that to glorify him. About three pages later, man screws it up, Genesis 3. He, they disobey God, Adam and Eve disobey God, reject his command, eat of the fruit that he told them not to eat of, and therefore every person beyond Adam and Eve have now been affected by sin, you and me. Every person born after Adam and Eve, it, it, we've broken our relationship with God. Even the ground that we walk on is also affected by sin, but God and his love for us, I love this man, he loved us so much that he came to redeem us and to restore that relationship back. So enter Jesus, right? So if sin requires punishment and sacrifice, who, what's the one thing or who's the one person that can atone for all of the sins of the world of all the people, the spotless lamb of God, Jesus himself. So he came to earth. He died on the cross. He was buried. He resurrected Right, And when we receive this free gift of grace and we place our faith in him, man, we are restored and redeemed to him. Now, before Jesus left the earth, he gave us our mission, didn't he? He said, look, go make disciples. So every believer from, you know, from that moment when he ascended into heaven until he comes back, that is our mission. That's what he tells us to do. And so the question becomes, 
what are we going to do about it? Are we all going to hop on Amazon and buy a bullhorn and go stand at the corner with the Turner Burn sign? Turner Burn, man, you're going to, you know, get saved or French fry, whatever the statement. I don't even know what those statements are, man. You know, um, are, are we going to buy billboards down the Interstate 85? How are we going to rally around this mission that Jesus says, go make disciples? Well, that's where our vision comes in, and that is we're going to engage our communities through gospel, grace, and growth relationships. That is how we're going to rally our that's what we're going to rally around and put our efforts towards. And so how do we make it simple? We talked about that. Well, first we're going to identify our communities. We talked about those three areas, right? Where I live, where I work, and where I play, those passions and things that I love to do. This is where I want you to write in there again. You, you probably wrote last week. Where do you live? For me, I live in Summer Grove, okay? Noon in Georgia, Summer Grove. I work here at South Crest Church. And the things I love to do is mountain bike and do athletic things and, and, and all that, right? So I'm going to jot all of that down. And that's really, really important because God has strategic, strategically placed you within these communities. Now, our communities is not locked, remember, to like a, a zip code or geographical location, right? You could live in Sonoya, but work in North Atlanta. And like I said last week, I got a friend uh, of a family that goes here. They travel back and forth to Bogota all the time because they've got friends and family there too. So their communities span really wide, right? And so God strategically placed you in these communities for a purpose, all right? Now, one thing I kind of want to slow down and just kind of develop, and maybe we'll preach on this and talk about this later down the road, but I want you to think about this, okay? Work within your wiring. Work within your wiring. Just like I said a second ago, you were created uniquely. There is not another you in the entire world, Okay, you have been given gifts and you have been given abilities and you've been given passions and experiences and your personality, you're, you're wired, you're unique. And God, God wants you to you, God wants you to work within your wiring. Don't try to do something way, way, way outside of here, unless obviously God calls you to do all that. But again, he's going to put that desire in you, right? Ephesians 2 very, very familiar passage. It says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. You were created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A craftsman or a woodworker doesn't show up to a shop and just take a look at a bunch of wood piled up in a corner and just kind of throw it up on the table, hoping something happens to it. No, what, what does a craftsman do? Man, he says, I, I need a table. I need a table. Okay, so what, is it, what does he do? He begins to measure. Measures the space in which that thing needs to go into, right? So he begins to cut the lumber. Maybe it's rough sawn or however they want to do it. And they begin to cut it and measure and they begin to plane it down. And, and uh, they begin to lathe and turn the legs. And uh, they begin to, you know, join up all those uh, wood, wooden beams and planks and stuff. And they begin to, to sand it and poly it or however they're going to finish it up, stain it down. And then the craftsman will step back and say, I have created this for a purpose. Now a family can gather around it and eat a meal. They can have family meetings when the kids ain't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all ever done family meetings? We always did family meeting around the dinner table. Uh, but they created it for a purpose. Craftsman doesn't make a table and say, this is now my dresser drawer, right? No, he doesn't do that. You were created and uniquely wired. And so whether you're an athlete if you like to lift weights, that's what I'm talking about. If, you like, if you're in accounting, if you are a baker, if you're a musician, we got a lot of musicians in here. That is, God has uniquely wired you for that. 1 Peter 4, 10 says the, kind of the same thing. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. 1 Peter 4 is all about spiritual gifts. And so, but the, the, the principle is the same. You've been gifted in a specific way. So use it for God's glory. Use it for his glory. And the crazy thing is, is that it kind of removes the excuse from all of us, right? It's like, well, I don't have, a, I don't have this or I don't live over there. Or I don't do this thing. And I'm sorry, I'm an introvert 
well, okay, I'm not an extra, you know. No, you are wired uniquely. God knows that, and so we are to use that wiring for his purpose. God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. Don't sell yourself short. Don't think that you can't do it. No, you can and it's important. So identify your communities, work within your wiring, all that's important. And then we talked about number two is identify three relationships, right? That's how we're going to make this simple. We're going to take, make this tangible so we can walk out of this place right now. Well, in about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, we're going to walk out of here knowing exactly who it is and what it is that we're doing. So identify three relationships. Who is your gospel relationship? Who's one person in your life within those three communities that doesn't know the Lord? Okay, write that name down, Billy Bob, well, whoever it is. That's who you're going to begin praying for, focusing on, sharing the gospel, uh, opening up opportunities to, to just get together. Grace relationship, who's one person in your life that could use some unmerited favor? Somebody that's hurting or broken or in need where you can go and supply and meet a need. And then number three, who can you grow with spiritually? and your walk with the Lord. And so that's how we're going to make this very tangible and simple as we walk out of here uh, today and live the other six days of the week because our relationship with the Lord and our calling and our mission is not separate. It's all integrated, right? It's not a church life, and then I live this way, and then I got my church. No, it's all integrated. It's all together, all specific for one purpose, and uh, so today, if you flip it over, man, we're going to jump into this. Today, we're talking all about the gospel relationship. Gospel relationship, all right? So I kind of want to build on this for just a few moments this morning and, and kind of talk uh, about the importance of this. And so I want to start with why, man, why share the gospel? Why, why do we have to do it? Why, why did Jesus create it? This, why did he design it this way? Well, why share the gospel? Number one point I just want to make is that sharing the gospel is the responsibility of every believer. Every single believer. Now, unfortunately, here in the Western culture where you and I live, the church largely, Big C Church, is in decline. If you look at stats over the past many decades, the church is in decline. And there's a lot of, man, a lot of, we point fingers and say, well, this is why. And we made, you know, there's probably more than one reason. But I would say one of the largest reasons why the church in the West is in decline is because we aren't sharing the gospel. Believers are not sharing the gospel. Where we're seeing the gospel exploding and spreading like wildfire around the world, it's believers like you and me being bold and saying, I got to tell you about this Jesus. And we're seeing great movement around the world, but here in the Western culture, maybe we've gotten a little bit too comfortable, too lackadaisical. And, and you know, I've got some stats right here that are kind of sad, uh, but I wanted to share them with you just to paint the picture. Barna Research and Lifeway Studies, they've put these stats out for, for a long time, but I want you to jot them in just so you can kind of get this landscape in your mind. 61% of Christians haven't shared their faith in the last six months. 79% of Christians haven't invited someone to church in the last year. 98% of Christians do not witness to non-believers on a weekly basis. And 95% of Christians have never led another person to God. In the Western world, more and more, we Christian believers have made it the responsibility of the church, the organization, the pastors. It's your job to convert people to Christianity. And largely we've removed ourselves from the equation. But the reality is, man, this is, this is our central, this is a central command from Jesus. Man, go and make disciples. Go preach the gospel. Francis Chan uses this uh, this illustration like 10 years ago, and I stumbled upon, uh, across it, and I love it so much. I have, I have four kids. You guys, many of you have kids. And have you ever told your kid to go clean the room? Go, go clean your room, right? I've done it all the time. So for instance, you know, my son Jackson, Jackson, go clean your room. My son knows better. He knows what I want him to do. My son doesn't come to me and say, Dad, you're going to be so proud of me. I memorized what you told me to do. You told me to go clean my room. Are you proud of me, Dad? I'm not going to be like, good job, son. You memorized what I, what I said to do. 
He's not going to come to me and say, Dad, guess what? I've memorized how to say, go clean your room in Greek. Are you, ha- are you proud of me? You know, he's not, also not going to say, Dad, I'm going to gather up all my friends every Sunday, and we're going to talk about what it would look like if I cleaned my room, right? It's going to, it'd be awesome, man. I'll be able to see the carpet and, you know, it would be great. And, and no, but we do that in church world all the time, don't we? We talk about it. We, we, we read about it. We study it. We, we get down into the minutia of the Greek word and all that's important. Yes. But Jesus wants us to go and actually make disciples. Luke six forty six says this, Jesus talking, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Man, guys, as believers, we got to tell him. And here's the cool thing, okay? Let everybody up for air. This doesn't have to be the story of Southcrest, does it? We don't have to fall into the statistic of like 95 people not sharing their faith. This doesn't have to be our story. We can actually step up and be bold and say, no, I refuse to fall into this this lackadaisical Christianity. I am going to share my faith. I'm going to step out, and we're going to be a force for God's kingdom in our communities. I refuse to not share this hope of Jesus with those around me. 2 Corinthians 5, you got it there on your card as well. It's, It's another passage that just proves that it's our job as all believers to share the gospel. It says this, starting in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you've placed your faith in Christ and received his gift of grace, uh, he is a new creation. Praise God for that. The old is passed away and behold, the new is come. Man, I love that. Verse 18, all of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and what? Gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Did you know you're in the ministry Congratulations, you're in the ministry. It's not just pastors. It's not just people on church staff. All of us believers are in the ministry. You have a job. If you've accepted Jesus and he's reconciled himself to you and you to him, guess what? You're in the ministry. Verse 19, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to them the message of reconciliation, which is the gospel, proclaiming the gospel. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Oh man, how cool is that? We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So what is the ministry of reconciliation? It's sharing the good news about the forgiveness of sin and new life in Christ. That's what we're supposed to go and tell people about. So why do we share the gospel? Number one, it's our our responsibility. It's what we signed up for. Number two, obviously a relationship with Jesus brings new life. So why wouldn't we share this hope with those around us? How much do we have to hate someone not to share the gospel? I'm going to come back to that statement here in a minute when we wrap up. A relationship brings, uh, uh, a relationship with Jesus brings new life. That's what 2 Corinthians says at the very beginning, what we just got done reading, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. God just doesn't put a Band-Aid on us and say, hey, man, good luck. He doesn't just take the broken pieces of our life and glue them back together. No, it's brand new. It's fresh. It's what we celebrate in baptism every single time we see a baptism happen, right? Monthly, we're seeing people baptized here. When they get into the water, what happens? They go under the water, symbolizing that their old sin nature, that the old way of life has died and passed away. And as they come up out of the water, behold, they come up to new life, to walk in the newness of life in Christ Jesus. And so why wouldn't we share this amazing hope that when we come into a relationship with Jesus, we just see life differently and we live life differently and and we experience things differently and and God just, man, gives us this abundant life. It's the hope of the world, guys, and we have to share it. And so, man, it's very, very important. It's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's nobody else's but yours. It's nobody else's but mine, right? We're not passing the buck. It's my responsibility. I want us to buy into that. Number two, man, why wouldn't we share the, 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 this hope 
uh, this new life with Jesus. And so how? Let's get into this for just a couple of minutes as we kind of wrap up towards the end here. How? Well, man, there's a lot of different tools and ways and things to think about when it comes to how to share your gospel. And we're going to talk about them in the weeks and months and years to come here. We want to equip you to share your faith, and we want you to have those tools in your belt to, to go. You know, there's no sweat evangelism and Romans Road and, and the three circles and all these little tools to help kind of conversations happen around the gospel. But there's, there's two things I want to point out to you today two things I want to point out to you today. And number one is this. Most times, it's a journey to Jesus. Most times, it's a journey to Jesus. We got this whiteboard. Like I said, you guys are in trouble. If I got a whiteboard, y'all, y'all are in trouble. It's a journey to Jesus, all right? And uh, it's very rare that somebody that goes, you know, from no knowledge of Jesus, boom, to placing their faith in the Lord and, and being a mature Christian, right? And so back in the 70s, this guy named James Engel created this Engel scale, and you've got it right there on your card. And uh, basically what he ends up saying, and the statistics shows that it takes sometimes two to four years for people to, to understand what they're doing and to place their faith in Christ. Now, is it always like this? No. So don't, don't send me an email and say, well, man, my life, that didn't happen that way. This is just a model, okay? It's just to get our mind thinking about it in this way. And so the way that he kind of talks about this is like, let's say negative 10 here, zero plus 10 right there, okay? And no, people are not negative. So, I'm not, so don't send me an email about it being negative either, okay? So let's just say that over here, people have maybe no interest, excuse my spelling and my handwriting. Let's say here they place faith in Jesus. And all the way over here, let's say that they're a mature Christian. Okay, boom. When people journey to faith, a lot of times it's these multiple steps. It's these incremental moments in their life that, that kind of draws them. As God is, and the Lord is drawing and convicting, it's, it's, this, it's a scale. And so, for instance, let's say you've got a friend who's right here. They don't care about God. i got a lot of friends that way. They don't care. They're not even interested in church, Jesus, none of that. Life is great, right? A lot of us know people like this. No, not, no don't care right? And so then something ends up happening in their life. And again, not everybody, but uh, maybe a crisis happens in their life. And let's just say, I don't know, you know, a lot of times when people lose a loved one or they, they get in a very serious car wreck, I've got a dear friend of mine who got in a very bad car wreck. And it was that moment that the Lord kind of got a hold of his life. But it took a kind of a crisis or something that happened in their life or a divorce or something. But anyways, John of the Cross back 400 years calls it the dark night of the soul. Like it's this wall you hit. And then all of a sudden you start wondering, why am I here? What, what, you know, is life just suffering? You know, you start asking these deep questions. Who put the stars in the sky? What, what, what are we doing here? And something happens to where it awakens them. And so, and then they become, you know, curious, spiritually curious. So maybe they go on a journey like Josh McDowell, right? He went on a journey to disprove Christianity. And so in, in doing, uh, trying to disprove Christianity, he becomes a Christian and this huge person of faith who uh, is witnessed all over the world, right? And so that was a part of his journey. He became curious and didn't like Christianity. Trying to, trying to, you know, disprove it. And so, so anyways, you, you become curious. And then uh, maybe uh, you're introduced to the gospel. That's where we come in, right? That's that name on your sheet right there. Billy, whoever's down there, that is, that, that's your gospel relationship. And, and through a relationship with these people, we introduce them to the gospel. And so maybe that just looks like simply loving them well, hanging out with them, buying a pizza and going and watching the baseball game together, right? And just being in relationship. But anyways, they, they are introduced to the gospel, right? And so they journey on a little longer. And then they finally, they begin to understand the, the implications. Wow, that's terrible. Implications um, of what it means to be a Christ follower, right? Oh man, so I've got to ask for forgiveness. I have to surrender my life to him. Oh wait, I'm, I'm a sinner? Woo, okay. I'm understanding this, right? And, it, and it's this whole journey all the way to, man, they finally, okay, God, I'm placing my faith in you. He, he's drawn him. Now, our job is just to, to tell. 
it's God that does the saving. It's God that does the convicting. We're, we just proclaim. We just tell people about it. And does it look perfectly linear like this every time? No. Sometimes people regress. Like, I'm a sinner. No, man, I'm a good person. I'm not a sinner. Boom. It's like, no, I go back, you know. And it's this, and it's this journey. And, and we have to, as believers, we need to identify where our friends are and help them take their next step. That's the whole point of this. Now, is this a measuring stick? And is, is this, you know, do we need to put a number over our friend's head? No, none of that. I just want us to identify, you know, at, what kind of questions do they have? I remember uh, a guy that goes to our 930 service. He called me a few weeks back and said, man, I got a friend at work I'm witnessing to. He is struggling with the validity of scripture. He, he, he's wrestling with, is the Bible real? real? What, do I, what do I do? How do I help him? right? And so he's trying to help him, that guy, identify where he's at, taking the next step towards Jesus. Okay, I'm understanding this now. Okay, great. And so what questions do they have? Are they stuck on a particular issue? Do they, not e- do they just need to see you loving them well? They, do they just need to experience the kindness of God? So man, where, where does your gospel relationship, so to speak, land on that scale? What questions and how do we, how do we help them just simply take the next step? That's being intentional, isn't it? That's being intentional with our relationships. And then finally, number two is this. Start with your story and stick to what you know. Start with your story and stick to what you know. We talked about this over the summer. Remember John chapter 9, the God, God, Jesus healed the blind man. And the Pharisees are trying to call Jesus this, this sinner and this liar. And, and they're trying to catch Jesus. And, and they're grilling this blind man with all of these questions. And you remember what he said in John chapter 9, 25. He's, he answered, whether he's a sinner, talking about Jesus, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Your story is powerful. And I tell everybody, start there. And I know you've heard that before, but I'm telling you, you don't have to have all the questions answered. You don't, ha- you don't need to know your eschatological stance on, is it post tribulation what? I don't know. But here's what I do know. I once was an addict, but now I'm set free in Jesus. I once was labeled uh, this way, but now I'm a child of God. I once, th- this, this is what I used to live for, but man, now I live for this. Start with your story, man, and stick to what you know. And so for, for, for decades, people have been kind of crafting their, their testimony this way, the three, the three questions. What's, what was your life like before Jesus? What was your life like before Jesus? Man, what, what did you used to live for? And how did that leave you empty and wanting, right? What would a non-believer kind of resonate with. You know, we don't want to necessarily stick to, you know, spend a ton of time here, but, but hey, man, I was, I was this way, but I was empty, and, I, and I, I lived for this, and man, I just, I didn't have any purpose. And then how did you come to know Jesus? What was your, who, who, who introduced you to Jesus? What were your initial steps as you were walking? What, what questions did you have? What, what struggles did you have? And then when did you finally just turn your life over to Jesus. Jot it down. Jot it down on that card. Use it. And then number three, how's your life changed since then? How, how does your life look differently? And, and, and what motivates you now? And what do you, what do you live for? And we know life's not perfect, but how has the Lord shaped you? And how's knowing Christ helped you deal with that fact? So you might have been around church for 20 years, 30 years. You might have seen that a hundred times. I want, I want you to do it. Will you guys commit this week to writing out your testimony? I know it's simple and I know it's basic, but just that exercise of writing that out is, is, is vitally important. Will you all commit to doing that? A three-minute testimony. It doesn't need to be long. You don't want to bore somebody to death. But let's say you invite a friend up to Atlanta to go to the baseball game, Braves game or something, right? And you're driving up. Man, hey, let me tell you my story, man. This is a crazy story. Can I tell you this? And you got it down in three minutes as you're going to the Braves game. But you need to do the legwork so that you're prepared to do it that quickly, right? So will you all commit with me this week just to do it? Sit down. Take 10 minutes and sit down and write that out. I'm going to ask Ben Hosey to come on up. And uh, he's going to kind of share just a, a, an amazing story. But before he comes and shares, I made the statement earlier 
how much do we have to hate someone not to share the gospel? You remember that statement I said? I said I'd come back to that here. Uh, many of you know Penn and Teller, right? You've, you've seen their TV show online. Uh, or on you know TV, that whole fool us. They're famous magicians, and so if you know anything about them, you know that Penn is is an atheist. He does not believe that there's a God at all. And uh, there's a video out, maybe ten years ago. I don't even know how long ago it was. He he posted a video. He filmed himself, and uh, you can watch it today. Go to YouTube and just search Penn receives a Bible. Penn gets a Bible, and. Um, he takes about five minutes and he talks about how impactful this moment was that somebody gave him a Bible. And so after the shows, he's signing autographs and hanging out with people. And there's this guy waiting patiently over in the corner, waiting his turn, waiting his turn. And so Penn finally makes his way over there. And he said he had one of the greatest conversations with this Christian. He, kept, he keeps saying in that video how kind he was and how loving and how gentle and sane he is, right? And that how an atheist and a Christian can actually have a good conversation. And it moved him that he gave him a Bible. And now this is what he says. This is a little excerpt from that video. I've always said I don't respect people who don't proselytize, okay? And that just means, again, to convert or to share their faith. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize and who just say, leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself. How much do you have to hate someone not to proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? He goes on to say, I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you and this is more important than that. And he just kept talking about that moment. Now, at the very end of the video, he says, man, I'm still an atheist. I don't believe that there's a God, but I so respected this person for sharing the gospel. Now, I believe... That he's that he may you know he's not interested doesn't believe but maybe he moved just that much because somebody had the boldness to say hey Penn I want you to have this just powerful man it's powerful Ben Hosey come on up y'all give him a hand y'all know Ben Hosey <laughs> Woo. so we talked about um, the three circles where we live where we work where we play. And Ben has a, a really, really neat testimony, something that just recently happened, all about uh, just being intentional in the neighborhood and where you live. So tell us that story. Yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you about a recent gospel relationship for our family. Um, and this is a family effort. This isn't just a me thing. This is, uh, this is all of our family working together. But Kingston's really good about inviting the boys of the neighborhood to, to come on over and play. And we we kind of have an open door policy, you know, where, yeah, come on in, y'all can come and play, get to know you. And uh, he's also really good about inviting them to the pantry, which is awesome. <laughs> Eat all the granola um, bars and stuff. Yeah, but no, open, open door, open pantry. Uh, if you're in our neighborhood, stop on by. We got a little something for everybody. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so this boy comes over and he says, hey, can I come back tomorrow? Well, yeah, you can come back tomorrow. And he comes back every single day. Well, at some point it gets to Sunday. Right? And if you're going to be around our family long enough, you're going to know that our faith is important to us. And so we just invited him to come to church with us. You know? And so he started to come to church a little bit. His mom started bringing him to church and, and dropping him off. And then at some point, this trust happens. Right? This is what happens when you build a relationship with somebody instead of just handing a track and like, I hope you make the right decision. And that really doesn't bear a lot of weight. But when you build a relationship with somebody, they trust you. And so he was struggling. He had some things he was scared about. And uh, try not to do that. I did that first service. It's always so hard. Um, our whole family got to sit there and share the hope of Jesus with him. And he prayed to receive Jesus uh, later on that day. And it was just, it was just powerful that, you know, we weren't even trying. We were just living our faith out. And that is so attractive to some people. And so that's my encouragement to you is just live your faith out. That's awesome, bro. Yeah. New believers class, right? And getting baptized. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, he's young. 
I hope I'm going to follow up with him today. He's supposed to be in the new believers class, but pray that he gets baptized next week. That's yeah, what man. we're working on now. So Let's go. Let's right. go. Man, that's it. Where we live, where we work, where we play, be intentional, share the gospel. It's the hope of the world. Would you back?